If you clicked on this video, I just wanted to say thank you and subscribe for some more Red Dead content. This is not stuff that I normally upload, and for some provided context, this series or these types of videos are basically just compilations of videos that are already up on the channel. Just making it easier for people to binge watch everything when it comes to character analysis or breakdowns or deeper looks at relationships from one character to another. Just to make it all easier and more digestible and to combine the individual videos as more of a complete series as a long form video. So that way you could just put on the background, go to sleep, you know, go to work, do whatever you need to do. This one here is all about John. Marston. I'm working on a video going into John's growth and how he's betrayed during the epilogue of Red Dead Redemption 2, and I felt there was no better way to build up to that than to compile all the topics I've covered so far in regards to John. So in this compilation, you can expect how vital this section of Mexico was in Red Dead Redemption in terms to John's character development, when and why John started to turn not only against Dutch but against Jose as well in Red Dead Redemption 2, and then we're going to tackle why John is objectively more brutal and cold harder than Arthur Morgan. And like usual, when it comes to these compilations, there's going to be chapters, timestamps, and links to the respective videos in case you want to jump around. But with that being said, I hope you enjoy, and I will see you guys in the next video. And like always, feel free to suggest what you would love to see next. Ms. McFarland. I'm married. I have a son. I had a daughter, but she died. Years before that, I rode in a gang. We robbed banks, trains, held people ransom. We killed people we didn't like. Bill Williamson was in that gang. Now, if I don't capture my former brother in arms, great harm will befall my family. John Marston has easily become one of the most beloved characters in video game history. His betrayal in the original Red Dead Redemption game helped solidify his position as a man who lived a questionable life in his youth, running with a band of outlaws that were killing, robbing, and doing whatever it took to survive. And while the gang's leader, Dutch Vanderlyn, put everything they were doing in the context of fighting for what was right in a world that was cruel and unjust, as an attempt to make everything they were doing better or somehow less savage than what it was, the truth of the matter was, it wasn't. John in the first game did his absolute best to try to redeem himself from his past. Transgressions that unfortunately haunted him, that would continue to follow him, and ultimately would not let him live to see his son grow up. Red Dead Redemption 2, John is seen in a little bit of a different light. Especially since the game is put through the eyes of Arthur Morgan, his older adopted brother who had more loyalty to the gang and Dutch than anybody else. Because of this loyalty, because of this refusal of Arthur to think in any way outside of putting Dutch in the gang first, John is seen as slimy, someone who can't be trusted. He committed the ultimate sin and ran off for a little over a year without saying anything to anyone. And while John may not want to be the father of Jack, accepting him as his legitimate son, or officially claiming Abigail as his prized wife, those are separate things from running off from the gang. As Arthur says, we have a code, and he knows that. Running off on that kid is one thing, but there's a code. He knows that. He ain't Trelawney. Dutch and you pretty much raised him. I know. But it's done. Has been for a while now. <sighs> Nobody else would have been welcomed back that easy after that long. And you know it. By all accounts, it appears John's return to the gang was one met with little opposition besides the rift between Arthur and John growing. Even with this sour view of John appearing to be less than trustworthy in Arthur's eyes, John still helps with the gang and looks out for what Dutch would want and how best to suit the gang's needs. This is apparent through John's initiative in setting up a train robbery during the missions pouring forth the oil and the sheep and the goats where he and Arthur steal some cattle off some ranchers and attempt to resell them at auction in Valentine. That is kind of brilliant. Uh, for you. <laughs> that is a real idea. I think that's the first time you ever had one of them. <laughs> Shut up. You might be the first bastard to ever have half his brains eaten by a wolf and end up more intelligent. What's worth pointing out as well is neither of these are shallow attempts to regain Dutch's favor or even try to rekindle their fractured relationship with Arthur. It's simply John doing his part, carrying his own weight, and trying to return to what it all was like before he left. 
but there was no obvious attempt of him trying to mask or hide from what he had done. He pretty much owns up to it. On the one hand, yes, he did choose to run off and escape the possible obligations he may have felt he had with Abigail and Jack. Perhaps it was as simple as not being ready for fatherhood, or maybe he was off looking to find himself, or maybe it was a mixture of the two. A personal crisis or not, it's clear he was still as loyal to Dutch and the gang, and was still all too willing to do his own part. I wanted to point this out because there's two sides to John. The love and loyalty that he has to at least Dutch, and the other side, troubled by his own personal turmoil that can easily be muddled and misclassified as being disloyal or unable to be trusted. That is Arthur's view of him at the beginning of the game, and because that's Arthur's view, it becomes our view. However, it's crucial to recognize that there is in fact a difference, and that difference means if we were to really pinpoint the exact moment where John's perception and opinion of Dutch starts to change and the reason behind it differs entirely from the beginning of the game to the moment where we actually see John's mood begin to change towards Dutch. And John's mood is much more apparent than anyone else's. And there's even a direct occurrence that led to it. An occurrence that, honestly, he never was able to recover from in terms of seeing Dutch the same as he did before. And that single event was the kidnapping of his son, Jack. All throughout the missions, blood feuds, ancient and modern, and the battle of Shady Bell, John's mentality is very different. He rants about how Dutch and Hosea went too far this time. There's always money. There's always something shiny. Something new for these two con men to get their hands on. And this time, the two of them flew too close to the sun, getting Sean killed and Jack kidnapped. It's Dutch playing his games. Hosea, too. Getting involved with those two families. Master con men working their magic. They thought there was a lot of gold. Yeah, they thought there was money. Ain't there always. Understandably, John is angry and in a panic, but we can't mistake this for anything other than what it is, and that's regret. John's words are nothing more than echoes of the pain and regret he has as a father, or lack of being one. No real attempts have actually been made to be a father to Jack, and John knows it. On the ride to Shady Bell with Arthur, John shares his doubts in Hosea, in Dutch, in their possible faulty memory, doubting if things were ever the way they remembered it to be. If they were ever the people they were meant to believe they were, he then continues to admit he rejected Jack as a son, who didn't choose this life, and is now paying for his father and adopted family's crimes. Abigail was also mistreated, and now, in this moment, John is realizing the weight of his actions, there are people counting on him, and he hasn't been as present as he should be. I treated Jack bad. Abigail, too. I didn't want to believe he was mine. I believe John's obligations and dedication to Abigail and Jack became a real priority for him from this moment on. We can say Arthur's own shift away from Dutch was somewhat similar, albeit much later, and only when he was on his own deathbed. Arthur eventually became hellbent on saving as many people as he could, most notably John, who had a family, a son, who could have something outside the life they all know. John's reality check technically wasn't as intense as being on the way out like Arthur's was, but Jack's disappearance and the fear of the unknown horrors that may be falling upon him was definitely one he needed, one Jack needed. What's also curious to me is how Arthur's response to all of this was. Up until now, Arthur made no reservations at telling John to just run off again. Why does he care if he went fishing with Jack when John says it's not his son? Likewise, why would he care what happens to Jack? John, after all, has made the mistake of turning his back on the gang and refusing to father this young boy once before. Why is this any different? This could have very well been another chance for Arthur to just remind John of his past mistakes and to just leave yet again. The only difference now is John's words are now directed at Dutch and Hosea, something I would think would even be worse in Arthur's eyes. Yet Arthur doesn't do what he did in the past, he doesn't repeat the same sentiments, instead Arthur does the opposite. He reasons with John, tells him to not overthink the situation and descend into a rabbit hole filled with anger, doubt, worry, worry of what will happen to him his son, his wife. Arthur admitted before that he was upset with John for leaving, but he does say it in a way that betrays more hurt from a brother who chose wrong and was so quick to throw his family away rather than just someone who could turn their back and walk away from a fruitful past. Oh, well, if it's John's idea, it must be a good one. <laughs> what is it with you and him? Oh, uh, he disappeared on us for a while. When Jack was real young, a long while, a year ago. He did? And we was family, you know? Guess I still ain't fully forgiven him for that. Arthur never hated John. 
He probably never even wanted him to leave again either. All the anger, jokes made at John's expense, or constant reminders of his past mistakes are most likely just his own hurt being manifested in a way that would seem acceptable by everyone else. Best to hide hurt feelings behind broken loyalty after all. But back to John. In the moment, his words, everything he's saying is justified and amplified by his own personal regret. This was the eye-opener for him. In the beginning of the bank robbery in Saint Denis, John's doubt is voiced yet again, showing that even after Jack's rescue, John's mentality towards the gang, their current predicament, the situation, Dutch continuing to promise and never deliver is a mentality that he's only doubling down on. And this time, John voices his concerns with a bigger audience and even calls out Dutch directly. This is it, gentlemen, the last one. Where have we heard that before? What has happened to you, John? You lost all your heart. I'm just trying to stay real about all this. Real? Oh, how I detest that word, so devoid of imagination. The relationship between Dutch and John only gets more complicated from here, with John accusing Dutch of letting him get captured during the Saint Denis bank robbery, then Dutch implying to Arthur that John or even possibly Abigail may be the rat in the cave on Guarma. So what happened with John in that bank? He survived. Unlike dear Hosea and Lenny, the only one they took alive. Why is that, you think? I don't know. I was already on the roof. I didn't see it. And Abigail, I presume she was able to slip away in time. What are you talking about? You know, when I look back at all the chaos of the past few weeks, the apparent superficial chaos, I begin to wonder, maybe, for somebody, this is all going exactly to plan. Followed up by Dutch seemingly dragging his feet to save John from Sissica Penitentiary, and then leaving John to die at the end of the Beaver Hollow train robbery after John was shot, it's really a different topic to question if Dutch even still harbored any type of hard feelings towards John for ever leaving. Hosea does say it was gone, it was done and dealt with a long time ago. Arthur even says that Hosea and Dutch forgave John, but maybe deep down he never did. It's possible. And the fact that John was so willing to call out Dutch in front of everybody questioning his leadership skills, all too aware of the current predicament that Dutch found himself in, Dutch may be narcissistic, he may be full of himself, he may be charismatic and a dreamer, but he's not an idiot. Accounting the losses all the way up until this point, and the fact that he was played for a fool by Angelo Bronte, and the Braithwaite's and Greys try to do the same, and now he's hearing a dissenter within his own ranks, maybe it was this moment exactly where Dutch made up his mind that John really wasn't needed anymore. The potential rage Dutch felt in this moment towards John could have very well brought to the forefront of his mind that this man, this son of his had left before. He had turned his back on him and he'll do it again. John's belief that Dutch allowed him to get captured in Saint Denis, followed by Dutch's lack of enthusiasm of saving John or Dutch's overall behavior during the chapter of Beaver Hollow where he's starting to get closer and seemingly listen to more of Micah, isolating Arthur and John. And then of course it all compounded by John getting shot on the train with Dutch and Micah refusing to go back and save him, all made that original thought. The perspective of Dutch playing his games become all too real to John. That was the moment John became a doubter in his father. That was the moment John's priorities shifted. And for the first time, he owned up to all the wrong he did to Abigail and Jack out loud. Even if it was in the sense of extreme regret because of the current situation that Jack was placed in, it was still a realization, the reality that he placed on his wife and son. Honestly, Jack's kidnapping may have caused a deeper rift in the gang than most of us ever even realized. What do you think? Do you think Jack's kidnapping played a pivotal role in changing John's mentality, or do you think that was something that was always in the back of his mind? Or it was really Saint Denis or any other event that, that caused the actual rift? I wanna hear what you think down below. And of course, like always, if there's video ideas, suggestions, or anything else you wanna see, please feel free to share that stuff down below. But like always, thank you so much for watching, and to the next video, maybe check out any other theories or analysis that I may have. All right, string the no good murder ambassador up. Let's try this again. Uh, Where's Mike? Uh, no, 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 no. Where's Mike? I already told you I ain't seen him. You lie. It ain't my fault. He tried to kill me. Where's Micah? Uh, talk, or I'll pull this lever. Talk. No, 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 no.
could Cleet have been redeemed, or is this a dry case of automatically guilty by association? Cleet is one of the smaller characters in the story of Red Dead Redemption 2. We have no information on what his last name is, possible aliases he went by, or previous affiliations besides running with Micah Bell and Joe, another character that's only known by one name. Cleet and by extension Joe are only in a handful of cutscenes throughout the entire game of Red Dead Redemption 2, with their first appearances being during the main mission, My Last Boy. So why are these two still here? Old pals of Mike, they're getting real comfortable. We need guns for what's coming. Cleet and Joe know how to fight. <clears throat> it's lucky I bumped into them. Although it's worth noting as a token of Rockstar's great writing, you can actually see Cleet and Joe wandering around camp a little bit before they are introduced to Arthur in the main story mission. But clearly, Understandably, Arthur is naturally standoffish and aggressive towards both of them. I mean, given Micah's well-established reputation within the gang at this point, I think anyone that knows Micah from his earlier years and chooses to ride with him again should be seen as someone who's possibly as deplorable as Micah himself. And Cleet and Joe are already introduced to the Vanderlyn gang, or rather what remains of it, at the worst possible time, to say the least. Tension is at an all-time high for everyone that remains at Beaver Hollow. The Pinkertons are close on the gang's tail, Dutch and Mike are continuing to get closer to each other, feeding into one another's own greed and recklessness, John and Arthur are starting to develop their own sense of what is right and wrong with the change in their own priorities, which in turn causes its own wedge between not only them and Dutch, but the rest of the members such as Bill and Javier, who, if you hang around camp long enough at certain points, can be seen calling John or even Arthur a traitor, telling them what they're doing is hurting Dutch and they should stop it, that they've changed. It's hard to precisely describe the tension and mentality that is surrounding everyone because, to oversimplify it, the prevailing sides are John and Arthur, trying to split off and do their own thing, versus Micah and Dutch, continuing on in the philosophy of what Dutch claims they've always been after. Only now it's through much more reckless and dangerous means. But to dig a little deeper within that camp of Dutch and Micah, I still believe the majority of people aware of what Micah and Dutch are doing and saying Dutch has changed is them more so trying to rationalize everything. It's a point of self-evaluation and retrospectively looking at their entire life. Because the man they've looked up to, the man that they've trusted so much in, is drastically different than what he's always been. I ultimately think that even though at some points they question whether if Dutch was always like this, the blame is still placed on Micah. There's still a love, there's still some sense of loyalty to Dutch. Micah has none of that from any of them, so it's much easier for them to just place it on Micah and grasping at any and every possibility to rationalize the person that Dutch has become or that Dutch is now. But regardless of how much power or influence Micah genuinely has or is perceived to have on Dutch, John, Arthur, and everyone else who somewhat stays still believes Micah's the primary source of everything. And it's with that belief that makes Joe and Cleet even worse, from the perspectives of John, Sadie, and Arthur. Just the way the two of them are around the camp, never venturing far from Dutch's tent, not really seen interacting with anyone besides themselves and Micah. The body language and their lack of enthusiasm to engage with anyone else that isn't Micah or maybe even possibly Dutch just goes to show they know that they are not welcomed. And yet here, they're basically treading on ground that they were never even really welcome to begin with. And knowing they are here in the good graces of the one that is blamed for the gang's current internal struggles definitely does not help their case. Now, I wanted to put a big emphasis on Cleet's introduction to John, Sadie, and Arthur because since we don't know much about Cleet before being brought around as a hired gunman by Micah and a lack of details pertaining to what he got involved with after the events of Beaver Hollow make it difficult to make a sound judgment on whether if Cleet could have been excused. And I think the possibility of him being excused is both real and almost a definitive no. From Sadie and John's perspective, Cleet's fate was always sealed. Because frankly, from a loyalty perspective, I don't think Sadie or John would have ever allowed him to live and redeem himself if he was even capable and willing to live a straight and honest life. John and Sadie basically handed out Cleet's death sentence, a death sentence that results in either John hanging him to death Stop! Wait, 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 wait. He, He's up in the mountains. I think he's, boss, he's up in Mount Hagen. He got a whole gang now. Bad man, doing bad things. I, I tried to stop him from murdering that little girl. 
we fell out. Honest. Please, I'm, I'm one of the good guys. Hang him. No, no. There ain't no need for this. He's done. Thank you. Or is Sadie shooting him in the head? There's no option for him to live as far as the two of them are concerned. And that is, even though he made it apparent that Micah quote unquote tried to kill him, that they fell out because he decided to try and get in the way and save a little girl from being killed by Micah. He even says that he's one of the good guys. John and Sadie are ultimately on their path to getting their revenge on Micah. By association to the man they loathe so much, a man who they blame for the death of Arthur, I mean, we can't forget, Arthur practically asked Sadie to stick with him and John in exchange for his help in finishing off the rest of the O'Driscolls out in Hanging Dog Ranch. I'll tell you what, I'll do it, but there's something you can help me with. Sure. You, me, and John. This whole thing is pretty much done, but Dutch still has our money hidden away, so... Well, how do you mean? When the time comes, just... Be ready. What do you mean? I mean, if we can get out of here with money, you and me, we ain't, we're more ghosts than people. And none of that loyalty matters. Jesus. Okay, I'm with you. Well, then you got yourself a gun. John obviously owed his entire second chance at trying to live an honest life to Arthur. And Charles developed a strong bond and deeper level of respect for Arthur after he helped out with the Wapiti situation. So from a loyalty perspective, the three of them would not let Cleet live. I think it would just boil down to the fiercest level of an eye for an eye from their perspective. My brother died and it's your leader's fault, so we're gonna wipe any trace of him and any connection he's ever had. His pleas for mercy ultimately just falls on deaf ears because they don't care. Their goal is just to find Micah. By running with someone so ruthless, then there's nothing more fitting than the ruthless end to your own run, regardless of how noble a single act of kindness was. But let's say that Cleet never had the original presence in Beaver Hollow. Would he have still been killed? Unless John or Sadie witness Cleet spare a child or be actively challenging Micah's more brutal tendencies, then I would still say, yes, I think he would still be killed. His fate would be the same. I think that's just based off of John and Sadie's feelings towards Micah and possibly anybody that's affiliated with him or was willing to run with him. There would be no sympathy for those types of people as far as they're concerned. Only with his lack of a presence in Beaver Hollow would now render him even more of an insignificant character, mainly just serving as a worm to inform us where Micah is. He would still be killed just without a second thought now, because who cares? His main purpose is just to die and tell us where Micah's at. And there's one more reason that works against Cleet's favor, and that is Sadie's newfound profession. She's a bounty hunter. We've seen countless missions where, even in the main story, how relentless, aggressive, and brutal Sadie can be herself. And the way that she was able to track Cleet down in Strawberry was because there was rumors that one of Micah's affiliates, someone who's wanted for murder himself, is hiding out in Strawberry. I find it very difficult to see her overlooking this bounty. I don't think she would let him go. I think it would just boil down to killing him, moving on, coming back, and trying to reclaim that bounty of whatever price that was on Cleet's head. I just don't see it in her to let him slide or any situation where she would grant a little mercy and allow him to run off. Maybe as a head start, sure. Yeah, she could toy with him in that way, but there is no legitimate second chances or turning over a new leaf, not based off the history that we have here. Let's say in an alternate history, he was spared by both Sadie and John. Would he be redeemed? Well, just trying to save a little girl, which he failed at, doesn't warrant him being a good guy all of a sudden. It doesn't change the person he is or what he's done any more than Arthur reluctantly saving the German family at the end of Horseshoe Overlook. Ah. Ein großer Mann. Ja, wirklich. Es ist ein Segen, dass wir sie getroffen haben. Come on, now get out of here. This place ain't safe. Get out of here! Ja, ja, Bamo. das ist wahr. Bamo. Uh, ich hab was für Sie. Einen Moment. Uh, um, Dankeschön. Thank you. Vielen Dank, herzlichen Dank. Guess it was a pleasure. Considering Cleet stood up to Micah and ultimately left, 
It does show he has more of a moral compass than Joe or anyone else that stood by Micah's side, so for Cleet there is some kind of hope, but we can't say definitively because we frankly don't know much about him or what he's done. His past can be as vague as any random NPC, or it could be as brutal and as cold-blooded as low honor Arthur. Is there a chance? Yeah. Can you say that? Can I say that definitively without a shadow of a doubt? No. Just based frankly off what we have. There's even the possibility of him finding a woman settling down and going the route of John and completely flipping his mentality and abandoning his outlaw lifestyle. Something Amos, Micah's brother, seems to have done. But let me know what you think. Do you think Cleet would have been able to be redeemed if Sadie or John allowed him to live? Do you think Sadie or John would have even allowed him to live? Or you think it's as cut and dry as Rockstar made it out to be and there's no alternative there? I'd love to hear what you guys think. And like always, I'll be down in the comment section interacting with you. But uh, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next video. No train driver wants to be cooked alive. That is kind of brilliant. Uh, for you. <laughs> and that is a real idea. I think that's the first time you ever had one of them. <laughs> Shut up. You might be the first bastard to ever have half his brains eaten by a wolf and end up more intelligent. Both John Marson and Arthur Morgan are incredibly well-written characters. So well, in fact, that it's easy to forget, technically, we are playing horrible people. And the majority of us, I want to say at least 99% of us that have played both games, are more familiar with the story of Arthur Morgan, the man who was loyal to a fault, blindly listening to orders, doing whatever it took to satisfy Dutch and the gang's needs. Very rarely, I mean, he jokes about it, Hosea does as well, well, seemingly everyone around him, all like to poke fun of Arthur being this brute, this enforcer, someone that's just basically doing what he's told, and that is it. He's not a thinker. If that was the case, or even if he placed his own desires, wants, and needs in front of Dutch, the gang, or just his overall loyalty to both entities, then chances are he would have ran off with Mary Linton a long time ago. But obviously he didn't. That's not the story we get. That's not the Arthur we got. It's not the journey that we're taking through. We're taking down a path of someone that suffered for blind loyalty and in a glorious fall from grace and a desperate scramble to at least save as many people as he can, he tries to do as much good universally to at least feel better for himself. With the game being much newer, way more ambitious, and in some ways a lot more accessible than the original game, those are all factors that play into why so many people have played Red Dead Redemption 2 and have yet to play the original. Maybe one day we'll get a real proper remake of the first game, as I feel, you know, I think that game deserves that amount of love and attention, but for those that have never played the first game, what you're missing when it comes to John is he's almost an entirely different person. Now, of course, things change over time. People change, they grow up, they mature, or even they harden over time. Their priorities, their goals, the things that they're focused on and how they handle certain problems or situations may all change. That's just how we grow up and evolve with time and experience. The first game is set some time after the events of the second. John is much older. And I do have a couple videos coming out set to really compare and contrast Arthur to John in depth. So if you're interested in that or any other Red Dead content, please feel free to subscribe. But there's something that I mentioned in a previous video that I was even questioned for, and I found myself thinking this way again. So rather than just confining it to a video, I wanted to share it here and get everyone else's perspective on it, and then I can implement it into videos moving forward, make it more of a solid community thing. But what I said was, I felt John was much more brutal than Arthur. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying Arthur's not brutal. He is. He's, as I said at the beginning of the video, he's loyal to a fault. He's got a one-track mind. There's nothing that he holds more closely to his heart than loyalty. If it wasn't for Dutch, if it wasn't for Hosea, or even the gang at large, whoever Arthur ends up with, it's a life and death type of situation. He will protect that person no matter what. And it seems like he would even do it to capacity where if he gets a little bit more of a softer side from say Mary Linton, it wouldn't always result in violence. And what so many people miss from John in the first game is similar to Arthur, he does have a one track mind, but it's kind of different. You see with Arthur, there's two things that I think separate him. The first one 
is Arthur's held accountable. He has to deal with other people no matter what, whether if he likes it or not, because there's still a gang he's got to go back to. And these other members of the gang are involved with their own little projects or plans or whatever that they have to make sure become successful in order to tell Dutch and everyone else that, hey, I'm earning my keep. A prime example is Sodom back to Gomorrah. Karen and Bill were planning on hitting the Valentine Bank. However, they couldn't do so because Arthur, Dutch, and John shot up the town of Valentine. So when Bill and Karen try to get Arthur to come on board, they have a little bit of a back and forth. And when it's pointed out that Arthur did his business in Valentine, Arthur says it wasn't his fault. And Bill points it out. Hey, whenever you fuck up, it's not your problem. It wasn't your mistake. But when he fucks up, everybody makes fun of him. We got something cooking you might be interested in. Am I gonna like the sound of this? Been cooking since Horseshoe, but you went and kicked up all that commotion in Valentine. Now, we was preparing to rob the bank there until you got involved in all that nonsense, and I don't know, I just feel like it's unfinished business. That wasn't my fault. It was just one of them things. How come every time I get in trouble, I'm called a fool and an idiot? But when you get in trouble, oh, it's just one of them things. So it may not be dramatic or completely drastic, but there's still that element there. You gotta be careful, because while you may not be bringing massive problems to the gang at large or even Dutch, you could possibly be stepping on other people's toes and you may have to deal with the repercussions or confrontation from that. So he is held accountable. John does not have that. John's one goal is a safe return of his family. And because John is in this little isolated state of mind, the anger in the position that he's in, I think, makes it worse. And that's another element I think we can all understand. Have you ever been so angry that you just start brooding? Nobody talks to you. You're just sitting there left to think more and more about whatever pissed you off. And next thing you know, the next person you see, you're just mean mugging the hell out of them. You just don't want to talk to them. You know that the second they open their mouth, all the shit that's weighing on your shoulders is just going to be dumped on them. And in your mind, it's their fault. Leave me alone. With John, he's left alone. He doesn't have anybody on his shoulders. There's no accountability. The writers intentionally left him black and white. We don't really know where his morals, values, and really line is drawn. And a lot of John's biggest, let's say, atrocities were all committed in Mexico. If we can add a little bit to how I said he's isolated and he's left alone, keep in mind, when John went to Mexico, the way he was greeted probably pissed him off more. I mean, think about it. He's got to go to another country to hunt down one man that's not only one of the guys he's got to hunt down, but he's possibly harboring the other guy he was originally hunting, this of course being Javier Escuela and Bill Williamson, and as soon as John tries to cross the river, he's getting shot at. Because the guy that's bringing him to the country, a man simply known by Irish, pissed off the locals. So now John is left to deal with the relationship that Irish established. On top of that, Irish already pisses John off because he tried to betray him at least once or twice. After John clears out the hostile locals, he makes his way to a nearby village where three people try to rob him. Holy gringo, I think you're forgetting something. A little taxation. <laughs> I have a large family. Very big. <laughs> I too have a family friend. So that we may see our families again, I suggest we part ways amicably. <laughs> can I see the boots, gringo? I think you can see them from where you're standing just fine, senor. Take off the boots, americano. All of this compounded by the fact that there's no one really for him to talk to, or even, as I said, Arthur had some type of accountability that was going to come back his way. John doesn't have that. John also has little care for anyone else besides his primary goal of his wife and son returning. This is something that Landon Ricketts, a gunslinger hiding out in Mexico, identifies and he even tells him, you can't be jumping on both sides of the fence because eventually you will get impaled. Our enemies by the day, perhaps you would know. Rumor has it you've been making all kinds of new friends. I don't pay much attention to just rumors. Just be careful, John. Keep jumping from one side of the fence to the other. You might just get impaled on it. I have to find these two men. With respect, how I do it is no concern of yours. Choose your tone wisely, partner. Remember who you're talking to. How could I ever forget? Who are you, John Marston? Apart from a rat feeding every other hand he can find, my name means something. And it's that conversation that kind of foreshadows what John ends up doing. Because at this point in time, Mexico's caught in the middle of a revolutionary war. John helps out both 
the rebels and the army and it's during the missions where he helps out the army that he does some of the more messed up stuff that i was talking about one mission in particular, John goes to help the army clear out a village that's known as a rebel hideout. After all the armed men are killed, the Mexican army rounds up the women that are hiding there and ships them back off to the colonel that runs the area. And then they order John to burn all the houses. John doesn't do it exactly enthusiastically, but he doesn't stop them either. He does exactly what he's told. I heard the little horse crying in that house over there. <laughs> Remember! Nobody takes them before Allende. We did all this just to get women for Allende? <laughs> no, that's just a bonus. This village is riddled with rebels. Make sure they don't have homes to come back to. There are fire bottles over there. Use them to burn down some of these houses. And what makes you think I'd do that? You want to find Javier Escuela, don't you? John, you're helping Mexico. Vámonos, muchachos! ¡Buen trabajo! <laughs> So in this one mission, John stomps out rebels that are already repressed by the local government. He takes part in human trafficking by allowing those women to get shipped off to Colonel Allende, and then he burns all the houses down. And there's never a moment of guilt or remorse. You could argue John had the same mentality that he was going to go out the same way Arthur believed he was going to go out. The way of a gunslinger, or he saw his death coming, and so why flip the mentality now? These are people that he doesn't care about. These are people that are kind of just obstacles in his way. His main goal is his family. Who cares about anybody else? Maybe if John got sick, similar to Arthur, we might have seen a mentality flip, but it's because of the goal, really the way he goes about it as well, that I've always thought John is a little more brutal than Arthur. John does some honorable stuff as well. The things that he does for Bonnie and her ranch shows a different side of him. However, it's not really an emotional plea. It's more strictly out of repayment. Bonnie and her father did save his life, so the least he can do is save the horses from a burning barn or any little help around the ranch. The writing and the amount of material that we get from Arthur to John is vastly different. So, of course, we just have what we see in the game to go based off of. And that was just always my take. Just the things John did alone in Mexico brings to question how far are people really willing to go for their family, for their loved ones, for anybody or anything they hold valuable? And to what point can we sympathize and root for that side until morals and ethics of the situation become a bigger issue? And if we were to venture a little bit outside of just the narrative, John does also have a stranger's mission where you can threaten someone's wife or hogtie her and bring her back to her husband. I mean, technically you can pay him off too, but if it wasn't within John's character to do that, I don't think Rockstar would have left that as an option to do. So it kind of goes back to the one track mind. Arthur upholds loyalty, and yes, he does some horrible shit. At least he's loyal, and that's what you can always count on. John seems to just have one goal in mind, and he's the Hellbringer. As long as that goal is achieved, then he's satisfied. But of course, that's just my take on it. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions. If there's anything else you want to add to this conversation, Besides some Arthur and John videos coming out, I am going to be tackling some of their side characters from Eagle Flies, Rain's Fall, the German family that saved Arthur's life, and so on. So subscribe if any of that sounds interesting or if you're looking forward to anything. And like always, I'm taking suggestions or recommendations down in the comment sections. You can email me, join the Discord, or even follow me over on Patreon. But until next time, I'll see you all later. We can't always fight nature. John. We can't fight change, can't fight gravity, we can't fight nothing. My whole life, all I ever did was fight. When I'm gone, they'll just find another monster. They have to. We all get caught eventually, John. I guess the trick is to decide by who. In the sun-soaked expanse of Mexico, the year unfolds as 1911. Weaving an epic tapestry of redemption and unwavering resolve, John Marston, a man etched with the scars of a turbulent past and a damning history to say the least, embarks on a quest that transcends borders and delves into the very essence of humanity. The pursuit, Marston's pursuit, the very reason why he's venturing into this unfamiliar territory centers on two figures from Marston's tumultuous past. The elusive outlaw, 
known as Bill Williamson, once a former brothers in arms, turned fugitive seeking solace in the vibrant landscapes of Nuevo Perriso, a region that none other than Javier Escuela, another kindred spirit from the infamous Vanderlyn gang who calls this area his home, are now hiding it. Nuevo Perriso, a name that conjures visions of a new paradise, is anything but. It becomes the backdrop for a complex dance between loyalty and survival, between what is right and who deserves a second chance, not just at redemption, but just at being given the luxury to breathe another day. I hope you have a clear conscience, because you're about to meet God. <laughs> Nuevo Perriso is a region that is suffering its own hardships. The land, the people, are in the midst of a civil war. And as Williamson seeks refuge beneath the protective wings of Escuela, in a region where the arm of U.S. jurisdiction loses its grip, it becomes a gamble, fueled by the camaraderie forged in the crucible of outlaw life, and a testament to the bonds that endure even in the face of betrayal. In the heart of Mexico, where the sun kisses the earth with golden hues, Marston's journey unveils the complex interplay of morality and survival. The narrative becomes a profound exploration beckoning us to ponder the depths to which one man is willing to plunge for the ones he cherishes. The relentless pursuits of justice morphs into a sublime journey through the intricate tapestry of love, loss, and the uncharted territories of the human soul. The chapter of Mexico in the original Red Dead Redemption has to be one of the most critical portions in that game, especially when it comes to the overall character development of John Marston. The entire chapter perfectly exemplifies that John is always meant to be a morally gray character. There is no right, there is no wrong. That past he tries so desperately to shed often shines through his actions. Because while he's striving to live a different life, to turn over a new leaf, to redeem himself, the means that he employs in order to reach the ultimate end, no matter how noble, no matter how justified, no matter how beautiful that end is, the means are always originating from a life that he tries so hard to leave. In a way, it's almost the exact reason Abigail gives him so much shit for in the epilogue of the second game. He's trying to achieve another way of living for himself, an honest life, an honest way of living. One that frankly isn't even possible without his wife and son who have been taken from him. Undoubtedly a factor in the level of sheer no fucks given to everyone else in the process of trying to capture Bill and Javier. Now, I've already tackled the stress, anger, and most likely level of brooding John must have been going through in another video, so I'm not really going to be discussing that as a factor here. Rather, I want to get into what went down in Mexico, how John got played and used by both sides of the Civil War, killing rebels that he was told were bandits, contributing to John helping the corrupt Mexican army tighten its grip on the entire region, and as a result, flood the bedroom of Colonel Allende with sex slaves. Women who had the sole purpose of serving him, but was described as being recruits that were serving Mexico. Or killing any form of Mexican law enforcement in the name of a rebel leader who's seen as a true savior, a proper warrior against any form of corruption, an honest man for the people who, when in power, would do right by all the peasants and see to a free and prosperous Mexico. When in reality, that man everyone looked up to a man by the name of Abraham Reyes just lusts after women in power and eternal fame, no different than any other tyrant who has soiled the throne of Mexico before him. Do you have any idea how many times I've thought about the day I will march into Escalera and storm Allende's mansion? I think I have some idea. Soon it will be me sleeping on those silk sheets. What about the Chinese workers here? I hear you ain't exactly made them very welcome. That is different. They are an inferior race. You have all the makings of a great leader, Abraham. After a somewhat successful assault launched on Fort Mercer, John and his ragtag gang of local law enforcement, Nigel West Dickens, a snake oil salesman, and a grave robber by the name of Seth, while they accomplished in taking over the fort, they had no luck in actually apprehending Bill Williamson, the gang's leader and the target of John Marston. It was a bandit that was left behind that revealed to the group Bill had disappeared into Mexico in an area near a village by the name of Chuparosa the day before. Mr. Marston, we got a live one. He says, Bill's already run off to Mexico yesterday morning. <laughs> You'll never get him. Javier Escuela. He's gone to see Javier Escuela. That should make things interesting. Where in Mexico? 
How should I know? Oh! Where in Mexico, you little shit? <laughs> Someplace near Chupe Rose, I think he said. Embarking on a raft to cross into Mexico, John Marston and his guide, a man known as Irish, find themselves in a dangerous situation. You see, Irish's past encounter with the Mexican locals leads to gunfire being directed at Marston and Irish as they navigate their way across the river from the United States into Mexico. This causes John to be knocked off course on where he was originally supposed to be entering the country, but nonetheless, the initial introduction to the locals through Irish did not leave a favorable first impression, to say the least. Now, given Irish's dubious character and his inability to accurately recall his last visit to Mexico, or even the individuals he encountered before, skepticism on this just being a fluke was warranted. It's only when John ventures into the village of Chuporosa that he experiences a genuine face-to-face -face interaction with the locals. I'm like, English? <laughs> oh, sí, gringo. Hablo mucho inglés. Sí. Hablo... Filthy fucking bean eater. I'm no slippery little Mexican. Oh. I'm no little piece of shit. Shit. <laughs> Comprende, amigo? Comprende? <laughs> hey, what are you doing here, gringo? I don't remember inviting you to my country. I don't think you did, amigo. I mean you no harm. <laughs> <laughs> you mean us no harm? This is funny. <laughs> What harm could you do to us, exactly? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, amigo. I've always found this entire interaction fascinating. Some argue that it marks one of John's more ruthless moments, killing three people over something as simple as a hat. Personally, I see it differently. While I can't say he was entirely justified in taking those lives, the tension escalates rapidly as one man passionately repeats what Americans saw as Mexican stereotypes and expresses personal or collective hatred that he or the other two have most likely experienced. This not only sets the stage for the prevalent American sentiment towards Mexicans at the time, but also underscores the emotional intensity of this particular situation. It's not as simple as saying, John killed over a hat. In reality, John was deliberately being robbed and intimidated. The way this man spoke to him created a sense that in his eyes, the tables had finally turned and he was gonna make John pay for everything he and the other two possibly had to endure. And it was because of that, I'd say John was compelled to respond. It's a complex scenario where the dynamics of power and emotion converge, leading to an outcome that was far from being merely about a piece of clothing. I just wanted to point that out because claiming John killed some peasants over a hat appears to me to be willingly ignorant of what these three armed men were intentionally doing. If we throw on top of this of how John was welcomed into the country through a hail of bullets, one could almost forgive him for being so callous. But this is where John's path somewhat diverges. Here in the town of Chuparosa, immediately after killing these three men, John meets the famous gunslinger Landon Ricketts. Known for his incredible speed, Landon has opted for a life of silence, leaving behind his gunslinging days and becoming the unofficial protector of the people of Chuparosa. During his time with Ricketts, John improves his shooting capabilities, which in-game transfers into a better version of Deadeye, allowing the player to paint multiple targets before firing. But, John is also introduced to the side of the rebels in the civil war that's currently ravaging this region. By proxy, anyways. John can almost immediately do missions following Ricketts, the rebels, and helping the Mexican government, with the rebels and the Mexican government obviously being opposing sides. But for now, we're just going to be following what he does with Ricketts and how that leads into some of the things that he's doing for the rebels. But just keep in mind, while doing the missions with Ricketts and with some of the rebels, he's also in the background doing missions for the Mexican army, which can get a little confusing. But now that we got that confusion out of the way, Landon Ricketts and John Marston together team up freeing a woman that's a relative of one of Ricketts' informants. Simply known by the name Emilio, his sister Luisa was taken by the Mexican army, as she is identified as being a woman who was close to Abraham Reyes the leader of the rebel army that the Mexican army is trying desperately to stomp out. Luisa herself turns out to be a very passionate revolutionary. Coming from a background of peasantry, she firmly believes in the vision of Abraham Reyes, who promises a fair and free Mexico for the people who have been oppressed by the Mexican government for far too long. Now, I don't want to pay too much time in this, but Luisa herself almost 
immediately contradicts the nature of Abraham Reyes because from the very start, she mentions that she's gonna be marrying Abraham and she idolizes this man and he's everything that Mexico needs. And then when you meet Abraham, you realize that not only can he not remember Luis's name, but he has no intentions of even marrying her. His focus is primarily on achieving the status of the next president of Mexico. <laughs> she thinks she's your wife. My wife? These peasant girls, they believe every word a fellow says. So naive. It's really quite charming. I love peasants. Don't you love peasants? I love them. They have such purity. Are you gonna marry her? Ha! Marry a peasant? My dear boy, don't be absurd. I'm going to be the next president of Mexico. My wife will meet ambassadors, kings, other great men. The very thought that I would marry some peasant girl with a tight gun and the hands of a farmer. Well, I really don't think so. My mother, que yo la cuide, would turn in her grave. Which in some ways almost immediately betrays that even though the Mexican army is doing some horrible shit and, and is committing human trafficking for Colonel Allende, Abraham Reyes technically is no better. You're almost immediately presented with the idea of the lesser of two evils here. Even John catches on to it himself with quite a bit of dialogue calling Reyes out on what he would do with the power he obtains and what kind of leader he would be. John even sarcastically remarks to him to never change. But regardless of John's own position on Reyes and his love life and how he could just be using his potential rise to the head of the Mexican government for a little extra side action, Reyes does deliver on the one thing that the opposing side never had the intention of fulfilling, and that is handing Javier Escuela and Bill Williamson over to John Marston. You see, if we rewind a little bit, while John is learning the ins and outs of finer gunslinging with Landon Ricketts out in Chuparosa, he finds some time to make a trip over to the town of Escalera, the capital of the region in Nuevo Perriso and the headquarters of Colonel Allende the governor of the region and head of the local Mexican forces. Unfortunately, Marston doesn't make contact with Allende at first and is instead received by his subordinate Vicente de Santa, who pounces on this opportunity to use John as a valuable asset. John is here in the country to capture two men that are hiding out in the region, a region that de Santa tells him is running rampant with bandits, scum, and untamed land. Allos seek each other. They're possibly hiding with thieves and killers who pose as freedom fighters in the hills around here. They're united under one traitor named Abraham Reyes. Where could I find this Reyes? If I knew, I would be there, hunting him with everything that is true within me. Reyes finds you. Like cholera. The Santa actually uses this opportunity very nicely to mix in bandits and outlaws with rebels painting Abraham Reyes as the head of bandit country. But nonetheless, John here makes no alliances to either the rebels or the local government. Rather, he chooses to work both sides in what could be seen as a desperate yet morally bankrupt attempt to capture these two no matter the cost. We don't know it yet. It's revealed much later after Allende and de Santa used John to stomp out the rebels, but Bill and Javier were actually in the protective custody of Allende this whole time. John, none the wiser, decides to strike a quote-unquote deal where he would help the Santa and the Mexican army to tame the bandits to go after this murderer Abraham Reyes. Reyes is actually first heard of through DeSanta, even though later on our direct contact with Reyes is a result of John taking a liking to Luisa and saving him at her request. I already touched on Reyes' character and questionable reasons behind wanting power, but it's while fighting for the rebels that John really doesn't do anything that puts a microscope on his character and having us as players questioning whether if John saving his family justifies what he's doing. If anything, it's actually the contrary. John is going after the Mexican army and its leadership that not only lied to him, betrayed him, and then tried to kill him, all after using him to wipe out villages of refugees, forcing its occupants into captivity. I heard the little horse crying in that house over there. <coughs> Remember, nobody takes them before Allende. We did all this just to get women for Allende? <laughs> no, that's just a bonus. This village is riddled with rebels. Make sure they don't have homes to come back to. There are fire bottles over there. Use them to burn down some of these houses. And what makes you think I'd do that? You want to find Javier Escuela, don't you? John, you're helping Mexico. Vámonos, muchachos. Buen trabajo. 
placing women straight into the bedroom of Colonel Allende, and even wiping out an entire rebel outpost where those that surrendered were just shot rather than just taken as prisoners of war. John's entire time working for the Mexican army was just filled with questionable things. And these are things that I think in hindsight leads to a little bit of a flaw in the mission system of Red Dead Redemption. Going back, there can be some contradictions or even a little bit of confusion when it comes to the timeline. Now, originally I considered it a problem, but that's because I was looking at it in a very linear way. Here's John supporting one side, and here's John supporting another side. Mexican army versus the rebels. However, during the time that John is working with Landon, you're pushed a little bit more into the gray area. This is the one time where John is actually put in his own place by Landon himself. Landon is aware as to why John is here in this country. John admits that he's here looking for people, but in his own fashion, he doesn't give up the exact details. Landon Ricketts is all too familiar with what game he's playing, and he constantly does tell him that he can't keep jumping from side to side. Perhaps you would know. Rumor has it you've been making all kinds of new friends. I don't pay much attention to just rumors. Just be careful, John. Keep jumping from one side of the fence to the other. You might just get impaled on it. Where eventually he's going to get impaled on that fence. Now while working with Landon, he sticks very close to Chuparosa, so you're only confined to a small space. You're not really delving into the garbage or fighting for the Mexican army yet, but you are exposed to some of their doings, like capturing Luisa or condemning these innocent people to death that you have to save and intercepting a military convoy because of that. Meanwhile, on the same token, during Landon Ricketts' missions, you do have to save a wagon from some actual bandits. So you're kind of just eased into the whole territory of Mexico. I wish the whole timeline was structured a little bit better where you just had to complete all of Landon Ricketts' missions first, pushed into doing all of Allende's and DeSantis' missions, and then you were introduced to Luisa and then Reyes, because it would have made a lot more sense that way chronologically rather than this little mix up of going from Allende to Luisa to Ricketts, back to DeSanta and Allende, where then you're betrayed going to Luisa, having Reyes save you, and then siding with Reyes, who decided to forgive John and all of his wrongdoings in the country and all his actions and efforts against the rebellion because he saved his life and he's now fighting for him and realizes how valuable of an asset he really is on his side. It, it just, it becomes confusing. Or it could be just what Rockstar was really going for. You know, John jumping from side to side to side, causing pretty much chaos regardless of whoever he's fighting for or against at any given moment. And he's just a man on a mission. A mission that no matter the side, he does see through to the end. Ultimately, it's hard to say if John did do better or worse for the land of Mexico. He, of course, ended up killing all the local heads of government. With his help, he ensured Colonel Allende and DeSanta were killed, either by his own hands or by rebel forces. John ended up killing Captain Espinosa and seeing to it that Abraham Reyes was in charge of the region Nuevo Perrizo, with Javier Escuela and Bill Williamson either killed or captured. So, for John, it's a resounding mission accomplished. But what if all the lives he directly had a hand in affecting. Yes, he did save some lives without the landing records ensuring some people made their way into the United States. He did turn the tide of the civil war that was ravaging the area, but he also did contribute to an untold number of deaths. Who knows how many people were sold as sex slaves? Who knows how many people were up and relocated and had to move because of the mess John was bringing to their doorstep? You can't deny he had an impact on the region. Without his help, the rebellion would have died along with Abraham Reyes, who, thanks to John's help, goes on to achieve the status of president, but it's claimed that he becomes much more brutal in his ways of running the country than any other leader before him. Of course, letting the power get to his head that John even warned him about. All things considered, Rockstar in a way did a phenomenal job at portraying the moral gray area of John Marston during this entire chapter. But in order to get his wife and son back, was it really worth getting involved in a civil war? Toppling the pre-existing institution of power? He may say he cared little for the land or the people with his family being his primary and really only concern, but would that not be the ultimate form of selfishness? John reshaped the history of an entire region and of the entire nation, all for his dream of being left alone to solitude and passing into his old age with his wife by his side. Something we can all relate to, but is that dream so grand as to excuse all that he did?
Love them or hate them. Two very important parts of both Red Dead Redemption games are the moments that take place in the country of Mexico in the first game and on the tropical island of Warma in the second. Both are crucial to not only the character development of both John Marston and even Arthur Morgan, but it's vital to keep the story of both these games moving along. Of course, the reasons both the characters find themselves in such foreign territory are for drastically different circumstances, with Arthur alongside other Vanderlyn gang members such as Micah, Bill, Javier, and Dutch himself, all ended up on Gorma after trying desperately to escape the law that had them basically trapped within the city of San Denis, and their only immediate chance to escape the daunting presence of law enforcement without alerting anyone to where they are or what they're up to was by stowing away on a ship that, due to bad weather and a fire that erupted on board, resulted in it capsizing, and those who survived stranded on Guarma. Meanwhile, John Marston's mission to hunt down Bill Williamson was really the sole reason why he ended up down in Mexico. That, and possibly even saving a bit of time as another former gang member of his, that being Javier Escuela, was also down hiding in Mexico. Now, we don't actually know definitively if John was going to be sent down to hunt Javier Escuela, no matter what, but whether if he would have had to later on or not, it really doesn't matter. With Javier Escuela being down in Mexico, you might as well knock two birds out with one stone. Oh, you shit. Don't be sure about what you're doing, brother. You saw me out. Didn't that life we had mean nothing to you? Ah, oh, ah, oh, you puto. Ah, oh, one day, one day I promise you, you're gonna regret this. One day's about all you got left. Oh, I hope you and your wife and children rot in hell. But it was with this objective to apprehend his former outlaw companions in order to save his wife and son that explains how and why he was down there. Over time, both the chapter of Mexico and the chapter of Gorma in their respective games have gotten some criticism and even equal appraisal. Mexico was a whole new area to explore. It was pretty much as fleshed out as the area of the United States in that game was, with a decent amount of missions playing both sides of the revolution that was ravaging the country of Mexico at that time. There were more strangers to meet, many places to see. It was exciting, it was a brand new section of an entire map. Although over time, and I mean it does make sense as the game was released back in 2010, but the vast distances from A to B feel pretty barren, as does most of the game really. It's more of a complaint tied to technological restraints if anything at all, and it's not exclusive to just the section of Mexico. However, the many ridges and cliffs that are pretty much all over the place throughout Mexico, making you unable to just cut a clear path whenever and whenever to just go from point A to point B, was a little frustrating for some and the plot did rub some people the wrong way. John is seen as absolute scum in this chapter. He is at his worst by some people's accounts. He holds no loyalty to anyone here and is only here to retrieve the two men he was sent down there for. Because of this, John helps both the rebels in the military and the revolution, doing harm to both factions and caring little for the repercussions of his actions. This left a bad taste in the mouths of many people. And for some, making them do a double take at John as a character, is what he's doing really that good? Initially, it seemed like he was doing the world a favor since he's hunting down cold-blooded outlaws, but now he's partaking in killing people that are fighting a system that is oppressing them, that's corrupt, burning down villages and stripping people from any type of protection that they've had from this oppressive system. Not to mention it does add a little bit of issues within the plot point itself. It makes it difficult to really invest yourself into one specific character or one side within the game's revolution. The only two people John holds any kind of attachment, or appears to anyways, is Landon Ricketts, who basically teaches John how to improve his shooting and gives a proper rundown of how everything is ran in this country. He's also the only one that tells him directly that he is basically going to screw himself over in the end because Ricketts is aware that he is playing both sides and it's a very dangerous game that he's playing. The other character is the revolutionary woman by the name of Louisa. I think out of everyone John meets, it's Louisa who he shows the most compassion for since he does help save her, save her family, and even save the rebel leader Abraham Reyes at her request going to go and rescue him or die trying. Oh, whoa, whoa. I don't think that's such a good idea. Me to near the jail. We'll figure out how to rescue him. 
Mr. Marston, you are truly a friend of this land. So everyone keeps informing me. John even shows proper disgust when Abraham reveals to him that he has no plans of marrying Louisa. Are you gonna marry her? Ha! Marry a Pessy! My dear boy, don't be absurd. I'm going to be the next president of Mexico. My wife will meet ambassadors, kings, other great men. The very thought that I would marry some peasant girl with a tight gun and the hands of a farmer. Well, I really don't think so. My mother gave you luck with it with turning her grave. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Luisa won't stop gushing about how she loves this man and they're going to be married and they're going to be running Mexico together. Reyes shares that peasant girls believe everything they're told and even suggests John has his way with her when he gets a chance to. Maybe it's a reflection of his own marriage and the loyalty he has to his wife Abigail. It could also be a soft spot he has for Luisa or even repulsed by the man Reyes appears to be. Either way, it can at least appear to be some attachment to her, and that is something that's not there for anyone else. And while we're on the topic of criticism, I always found it a little odd that Abraham Reyes never made an attempt to punish John for his time helping DeSanta or Colonel Allende. The people that are in charge of the Mexican army, you know, the force that is responsible for the killing of many women, children, and even the execution of Abraham's own men. Yes, John did help Reyes take over this region and kill the Santa and Allende, but he's not going to be faced with anything. Not even a threat of, if I ever see you down here again, you won't be faced with such a warm welcome by me. Next time you're in my presence, it'll be at the end of my gun for all of my men that you killed. Without that form of punishment or result from his actions, it adds to a feeling of just shrugging off everything John did. As if all the bad he helped perpetrate was forgiven, and he was redeemed just because Reyes is now in charge. The chapter is certainly not perfect, but I would still argue that Mexico, at least as far as John's character development went, was necessary. Rockstar always wanted him to be seen as a morally great character. We don't ever see him do anything completely irredeemable. But his time in Mexico, he does just enough to have us as players question how far is too far to save the ones you love. To return to something we want so badly, Abigail and Jack unfortunately never disclose too much information on what their time was like in federal custody, so we can't even say his wife and son was tortured or if John didn't capture these wanted men by this specific time frame, his wife and son would be executed or tried for his crimes. Those would be some elements that I think would make what he did more within reason and make the question of what he did for his family was really worth it or not. I think it would have been a much more complicated question. Gameplay wise, the chapter's up to snuff as the rest of the game. Narrative wise, it has a little bit of back and forth to it that as a result of helping both sides of the revolution and the lack of any real long-lasting repercussions can mess up the pacing and flow since you can go to some rebel missions back to military missions which I think was a little bit of a mistake. You should have went military first if we were to keep the part where DeSanta tries to kill you as that's really the definitive point where John works exclusively with the rebels but from there only rebel specific missions would be available and have some of the rebels reference actions they know you did or military strains are under because of DeSanta and Allende's efforts you partook in. It would have helped with the pacing and even the narrative with the immersion going through the roof instead of the small disconnect that we have due to the omission of real accountability. Worm on the other hand I feel has almost always gotten a mixed bag of a reception, especially in contrast to Mexico from the first game. The area in Guarma is not as open or can be freely explored as the entire region of Nuevo Pariso can be. There's no new strangers to meet, and unlike the first game, there's only one side you're helping. It's technically the side of yourself, since you're just trying to get off the island and return to Saint Denis, but because that is virtually impossible given the tight control the authorities have on the island and the strict military response by the authorities in light of the island being stuck in the middle of a civil war, the criticism and appraisals between the two chapters are different. Some also claim that the section of Gorma is lazy and rushed due to the lack of free roam and everything being stripped from you in comparison to Mexico. Your arsenal is completely taken away. By contrast, Mexico, again, a whole new region compared to just a confined area in the jungle of Gorma and then of course a few small select locations that you can go through by means of the main story missions. Gorma is also considered even more out of place than Mexico and because of this, throws the rest of 
the story off a little bit. I mean, if you take a step back and think about it, the events leading up to Gorma finds the entire Vanderlyn gang trying to escape the swamp's a shady bell, an area that's been under attack by the rival gang, the O'Driscolls. Then they storm the mansion of Angelo Bronte. They kill him, rob the local trolley station, of course, not in that specific order, and then they attempted to rob the Bank of Saint-Denis, resulting in possibly one of the wildest shootouts in the entire game, with the gang suffering two of their men dead and one taken into custody. You can always cut a deal! I've given you enough chances. Come on! There's your deal, Dutch. Who's there? Fresh off the hills from one of the most adrenaline-inducing moments in the entire game. Gorma isn't exactly a walk in the park per se that brings everything to a complete standstill. Rather, it's more so the game goes from a set of problems surrounding the Pinkertons, trying to collectively escape the modernization of the world and with it the increased presence in unified law enforcement. They hope to achieve escaping this boost in civilization with some cash in their pocket, allowing them the luxury to buy some land and essentially make off scot-free with their life of crime. The Sandini bank robbery was their ticket out of this hole that they keep digging themselves into and essentially the entire robbery just blew up in their faces this dream crumbled right before their very eyes in the most spectacular way we can get across here no! Lenny, he's he's dead oh god no and for first time players this entire moment feels like the end. And because all of this seemingly coming to a head, then being pushed into Gorma, it makes it feel like a giant sideshow. You just want to get back to Sandini. You just want to find out how the hell the gang is going to recover if they even manage to. What's happened to those that didn't end up stranded on Gorma? Did they relocate? How are we going to find them? Do we even end up back in Sandini? If found, how is Dutch going to get the entire gang back together and rally under his banner? Does the gang recover? Meanwhile, the death of Jose and Lenny is still hard to process. It's the feeling of being distracted from what appears to be the overall bigger issues. I mean, the threats from the start of the game are basically the same, only now it looks like it's all about to just fall completely apart. But before we can find out how, the, how that happens, or if the gang can or does recover, we have to fight off an island far away from what is the gang's real problems. Out of the frying pan from one set of bigger issues to another pan with less engaging matters, in light of everything else going on. If we were to cut that off and just look at everything happening on Gorma, I mean it isn't engaging, there's a lot of action. Javier does get captured by Alberto Fursar, who is a dictator that runs the island that's essentially a giant sugar plantation where he utilizes the natives for slave labor. The gang is trying desperately to not let him discover who exactly they are since he does have ties to Leviticus Cornwall who does have a price on Dutch's head, but it is a fair point to say it's a sideshow. Luckily though, over time, Gorma's been looked at very differently, and honestly has become possibly one of the more important chapters for two major reasons. I would even say it's one of the more underappreciated chapters because tied specifically to Arthur, there's a lot that Gorma is significant for. The first reason, I mean, it precipitates Arthur's illness, the stress, the anxiety, the fear, constant running, the new tropical environment, being sunburned and even dehydrated for a period of time kicks Arthur's tuberculosis into high gear. After Gorma, his health rapidly declines and he never recovers from it. As soon as he comes back to Saint-Denis, he looks incredibly pale, he looks beaten, he looks tired. That cough has progressed beyond any kind of redemption. He's long gone practically at this point. His life is incredibly on a ticking timer. On the other hand, during Gorma, Arthur also witnesses Dutch commit actions he never seen him do before. Ah! Dutch, ah! what are you doing? Jesus! Easy, Dutch! What was that? Horrible old crone. But you killed her. She was gonna betray us, Arthur. Couldn't you tell? No. Well, I got some Spanish. She was. You keep killing folk, Dutch. I would say Gorma is the metaphorical deathbed. Arthur isn't exactly dying yet, but in light of losing Hosea and Lenny, 
two people that are important to him and then witnessing the strangulation of the old woman in the cave and if we were to even push the whole idea of contracting tuberculosis to the side there's no doubt arthur is tired i mean look at him he's been through hell he almost drowned and washed ashore Gorma. then he's put into custody then he has to fight off the authorities and then as soon as he gets the moment he asks dutch to rest who's already trying to get everything in motion so that way they can get the hell off the island i'll go scope the entrance to that cave Arthur, I need to get some rest. Well, you're right. We all need to relax. <clears throat> what a mess. I... Arthur's not in that position yet. I think just the earliest moments of seeing Arthur and Gorma, that's how he is throughout the entirety of Gorma. He's beaten, he's tired, clearly sunburned, and I would say incredibly dehydrated. I've said it before, the story of Red Dead Redemption 2 is a combination of Arthur and the gang at large. Arguably, I would say, Gorma, when it comes to the story of the Vanderlyn gang, isn't as vital. It's more of a very important role to precipitate Arthur's health and put into perspective this man that he's idolized his entire life. It's one of the moments where he, where he really definitively says Dutch has lost it. At this point in time, he's already seen Angela Bronte get drowned. Now, with him strangling an old woman with his bare hands, whether if it was justified or not, it still was a pretty brutal way. It's not like he straight out just shot her and didn't think twice about it. Strangulation is pretty personal. And I think that's also an element to that killing that not too many people take into account. It's not as simple as pulling a trigger and completely forgetting about it. It's personal, it's much more aggressive, and it takes more time to take someone's life that way rather than just shooting and walking off. And then if you look at Dutch's demeanor, how he stands over the woman before he engages in the strangulation, and then once called out on it, he tries to justify it by saying she was going to betray them, followed up by he knows a little bit of Spanish, Arthur should just believe him. I mean, Arthur's not dumb. Narratively, when you contrast the two, I think Gorma is significantly superior. With us receiving Gorma and not being able to walk around or free roam the entire island, or even, let's say, a major town, or village, or chunk gameplay wise it was going to receive some type of negative reception in light of mexico coming before it a full new map that you can explore but as i said before over time with mexico representing the wild west and vastness and you know not too much to explore from point a to point b the only major thing is there's strangers and you know new areas to go out and explore but taking a step back and looking at the entire story of red dead redemption 2 and as i said everything leading up to us ending up on Gorma, I don't know if an open section now, in a hindsight reevaluating the game, would have even worked. Was it really necessary? I think it would have detracted more from the story and the more pressing matters. Maybe it would have made more sense to make us be able to go and explore Gorma in the epilogue as John. Sure, that would have made more sense, but for what it is, if it wasn't for the series of events and everything that even transpired leading up to and happening on the island of Gorma itself, the story would have been drastically different. I don't think Arthur's tuberculosis would have been precipitated. I think during the events of Beaver Hollow, it all would have happened much differently because Arthur would have been much healthier. But I'm going to pass this on to you. For someone that's played both games, or even someone that's played one or the other, what do you think about these respective sections? How do you feel about them? Do you feel like they genuinely detract from the overall story? Do you feel like they add to it that they're required or the story could have happened with or without them? I'm curious to hear what you have to think down in the comment section below. For me, I think... Gorma is narratively superior and much more important to Arthur. Mexico, I think, is hurt by jumping from one side to the other. Gameplay-wise, like I said, you could argue that there's much more to do, but I would still say Gorma compared to Mexico now is a case of, you know, being condensed and having to having the ability to explore areas that are much more detailed and richer rather than areas that are a little more barren and sparse and far you know there's not too much to explore from point a to point b but like always my name is cynic thank you so much for watching and like usual if you have any suggestions on what to cover or talk about next please share that stuff down below i'm always looking for suggestions but till next time i'll see y'all later jack go into the house lock all the doors Whatever happens, don't come outside. You hear me? Whatever happens. Okay. Come here, son. Whatever happens, keep the doors locked and your mother inside. Promise me, son. Promise me. Who is it, Paul? It's just some old friends. Me and Uncle take care of it. And you go inside and you keep the doors and the windows locked. I hear you. Then run! Yeah, run, boy.
Here are the final moments of John Marston. With his death marks the end of an era. A time of men long gone, a kind of men the world doesn't want anymore. Nothing more than bandits, cold-blooded thieves, and murderers who care for no one else but themselves. The days leading up to John's demise were spent with him adapting fairly well to a domesticated life. He was finally left alone on his ranch, which he tried so hard to make work. Work was put into it, along with repairing his marriage and establishing his bond with his son Jack. Only for John to be ambushed by the US military and a Beekerton detective, Agent Ross, who, throughout the duration of this entire game, promised John clemency and a chance to live out the rest of his days with his wife and son if he brought in the remaining members of the Vanderlyn gang, old brothers in arms of his, that continued to breathe. A task John completed, albeit reluctantly. As it stands, the Red Dead Redemption series is one that seems to be meant for the moral question of, no matter how hard someone tries to make up for their sins, all the wrongdoings and terrible things that they committed in their lives will forever be stains on their characters and legacies. What they chose to do in their youth will never escape them. A world they rejected will soon pay them back the favor, equal to the passion and fervor they displayed in their youth, equal in blood payment and in vengeance. Today we're going to be talking about the deaths of John Marston and Arthur Morgan, two of the saddest deaths in video game history, although for different reasons. Both characters have different personalities, different way of dealing with things and of course people, and they found themselves succumbing to different things. Arthur was killed slowly and agonizingly by tuberculosis, a disease that primarily affects the lungs. If left untreated, it eats the lungs from the inside out, slowly diminishing any kind of lung capacity and causing the chest to fill with blood. During the later events of Red Dead Redemption 2 when Arthur starts to look undeniably sick, you can see him coughing up blood, displaying the advanced stage of his tuberculosis. There are limits. So, let me be very... <coughs> you okay, man? Someone, Jackson, take him away. Chief Rains. That's, uh, <coughs> Rains' fault. Exactly. Chief Rains, the thing it's quite is, a cough. The federal government... Sure. Wait here. I'll fetch you some water. I'll, I'll be fine. Arthur contracted his ailment while beating a terminally ill man to death that owed the gang money. Refusing to pardon the debt and after mercilessly beating Mr. Downs, Arthur threatens him in his face. It's at this time, Downs coughs in Arthur's face, sealing his fate. John, on the other hand, didn't have a death that we seen coming. While Arthur was spared no luxury in his swift death, watching his health slowly decline and with it the gang fall apart and how the remaining members of the Vanderlyn gang, most of all Dutch, all started to look at him as nothing more than a delusional liability, is heartbreaking and at times infuriating. He seemingly is more logical now more than ever before, yet because of his sickness and the unwillingness of others to side with what he's saying, he's dismissed as delusional and dying. Arthur's death is sad in his own personal downfall. It's never easy to see someone go from their top physical health, especially such as Arthur's, a person who's highly respected and even feared, to be a shell of their former self, no longer commanding the trust, the respect, the fear, or even basic ability to walk for a decent period of time. Arthur's descent is biblical, yet there's still some kind of silver lining with Arthur's death. Arthur spends the remainder of his days, arguably even his final moments, ensuring John, his younger brother whom he loved dearly, had a a chance to escape, to leave this life behind and have a realistic chance of living a normal life with his wife and son. A normal life that Arthur often was seen wanting to establish for himself with Mary Linton. Is it too late for us, Arthur? I can't lie to you. I wanted man, Mary, if I... If anyone close to me, well, they wanted to, and I can't have you wrapped up in there, but it's coming to an end. This time it really is. Run away with me, Arthur. Run away right now and don't look back. I want to. More than anything, I want to. But I've got some people I need to take care of. Once they're free, then I'm free. Then I can disappear. But Arthur... If we're going to run away anywhere, we'd need money. Soon, I'll have some. I know you won't run away. Arthur died peacefully on a mountaintop. While some people say he was abandoned, left to die alone, that may be true, but at least he can rest easy knowing he gave all he had fighting for those he truly cared for in the end. Something John only had a moment's notice to attempt to do. Surprisingly, a decent group of people have still not played the original Red Dead Redemption, so spoiler alert, when that's way overdue, sorry about that, but John dies in the original Red Dead Redemption. And similar to how Red Dead Redemption 2 as you take over John after Arthur's death, in the first game, you play as Jack 
after John's death. And to bring everyone up to speed of the events of the original Red Dead Redemption game, you take control of John Marston, who's being forced by Agent Ross and the Pinkerton Detective Agency to go after Javier Escuela and Bill Williamson and Dutch Vanderlyn, former gang members of his. John is forced to hunt these men down under threat of Abigail or Jack getting hurt by the Pinkertons who have them in their custody. In exchange for killing or capturing these men on behalf of the Pinkertons and the United States government, John has promised clemency and a chance to live out the rest of his days to die old with his wife Abigail by his side, and hopefully witnessing an adult Jack staying outside of John's previous life of crime and taking over what would now be a family ranch. We'll make it very clear he's no friends of the Pinkertons or the government and not really holding any loyalty to any side of the law with John's main drive being to reunite with his wife and son, he carries out the job pretty effectively. Bill, Javier, and Dutch are all taken care of. Abigail and Jack is released back to the farm, and there's a decent amount of time where John can rekindle his relationship with both his wife and son. The game seemingly feels like it's hitting a low point and is about to have a nice wrap-up. By contrast, Arthur's final moments in Beaver Hollow, it's not just his sickness that's going on. That's not the only thing weighing heavy on everybody's minds. There's the issue of the overall state of the Vanderlyn gang. Individual members are leaving. Dutch's trust is shifting. Everything seemingly is splintering and splintering very rapidly in multiple directions. Then there's the question of how the Pinkertons, Cornwall's men, the U.S. Army's portion of the story or that of the Wapiti Indians is all going to conclude. Since the entire chapter of Beaver Hollow, Dutch has been exploring every and any option available to him to cause as much quote-unquote noise as possible. There's an epic climax that is looming on the horizon and you just can't help but see how it's all going to explode in everybody's face. John's story is the opposite. There's no anticipation of a climax. There's no looming threat. You feel as if for a moment John is actually going to escape. He managed to get out of his criminal lifestyle and earn a place in the civilized world he tried so hard in his youth to reject. We feel as if he's going to actually grow old and do the very thing none of the other Vanderlyn members was able to do, establish a life for themselves outside of crime. Arthur possibly succeeded in saving his brother. That is until one day, with no warning, no provocation, no time to react, an entire US regiment descended on the Marston family ranch with one goal in mind to kill the sole remaining Vanderlyn member. John was tricked, used to deal with men just as dangerous as him. And once they were taken care of, it was now time the gun was turned on him. I think the majority of us are more familiar with Arthur's death, running up the mountain with John by his side, only to stop abruptly hunched over, gasping for air. Keep pushing, Arthur. No. <coughs> no. I think I've pushed all I can. Come on. You go. We ain't got time for this, not now. We ain't both gonna make it. Go. Now. I'll hold them off. It would mean a lot to me. Please. Arthur's death is sad for many reasons, at least his high honor death is, which I consider to be canon, I'm not entirely sure if it is, but for the sake of this video, I'm just gonna roll with it, because I find it most heartbreaking, and it seems as if the general consensus is Arthur being dishonorable, only to then flip his honor around once it's revealed to him how sick he truly is, but with Red Dead Redemption 2 being a much larger scale game, we spend way more time with Arthur, getting a deeper feel for who he really is deep down beneath the rough outlaw exterior everyone else witnesses, something we really don't get with John. Arthur has a death that humanizes the character, with his priorities and even loyalty technically changing from focusing on the entire gang's well-being and sticking by Dutch's side to then ensuring John makes it out of this life alive and settling anything else in his life that needs to be settled before his time comes. It's slow, it's painful, it's dragged out, yet it's one that displays the sense of urgency and fear people can experience when death is on their door and they aren't ready. The people they care for most aren't ready, they're still needed. John's death, on the other hand, was entirely unnecessary and was just a cold-blooded act of killing an unsuspecting man who falsely believed he had been forgiven for his crimes. John was outright betrayed by Ross, 
If you rewatch the entire last mission, it's actually pretty heartbreaking. John seems to finally have a healthy conversation with Jack, something he hasn't been 100% successful with. Now in this moment, they finally seem to have a very nice bonding moment that is abruptly ended by Uncle calling John outside to see the mounting threat on the outskirts of his property. John then embraces Jack and tells him to keep his mother safe inside the house. Once the first wave of US soldiers are clear, John secures a horse for Abigail and Jack, tells them to hide, and not to worry about him. He'll catch up. I'll catch up. Keep riding and don't look back. And don't be worried about me, you hear? Now get going. You stay out of trouble, John. Ain't no trouble, Abigail. Ain't no trouble. I love you. Yeah, I love you. Now go! Get! <laughs> Just a few moments later, John is gunned down in front of his barn. While John struggles to gasp for air, Ross calmly lights a cigar and smokes it as he watches John slowly succumb to his gunshot wounds. Laying there, bleeding to death on the property he tried so hard to make a new life for himself, John dies, not even fully aware of whether his wife and son made it to safety. While the betrayal of Ross is sad in and of itself, it doesn't end there. This mission witnesses the death of Uncle, who dies on the porch of John's house. One of the deaths that's, I think, always overlooked because John's death is just so shocking as it is. But the real sadness, I think, comes from after John dies. Abigail and Jack decide to come back, where they find John laying in a pool of his own blood. With this being a game from 2010, it's not really as tear-jerking as the death of Arthur is, but if you just look at the circumstances and how everything plays out, Jack and Abigail now have to fend for themselves and bury their husband and father, whom just a few moments before was alive and well. Now, he was killed in one of the most brutal ways possible with no warning whatsoever. Arguably, both Arthur and John were punished for what they did and the lives they chose to live without thinking twice about who it affected. Yet that doesn't mean any of it is less heartbreaking. John's death for me was always shocking and frankly upsetting. It left me with the ultimate question of why. Arthur's death was heartbreaking and more so instilled the feeling of, what if I did things differently? Either way you look at it, both of them in their final days did what they could to make the best happen for the people they loved and cherished most.